I'm going to be talking about the Royal Navy in World War II, really pretty much the uh, North Atlantic Theatre, let me say that. The Royal Navy had quite a lot to do with the Italian Navy one way or another, and the Italian Navy tended to come second best. So I've sort of skipped past that, and we'll deal with the main threat, the United Kingdom, which was the Kriegsmarine in World War II. At the outbreak, the Royal Navy in World War II had a total of 10 super dreadnought battleships and three battle cruisers from the previous conflict. They carried eight 15 inch guns and made roughly 25 knots. They weighed in at about 28,000 tons, so by the standards of later battleships, they were quite small. The battleships on the left, the Queen Elizabeth class, were rather faster and more expensive than the ones on the right, but the Revenge class were a rather cheaper version and didn't go quite as quickly. Of the Revenge class, the first Royal Navy battleship to be sunk in World War II was sunk at its mooring in Scarpa Flow, unfortunately, on the night of the 14th of October 1939 by a very, very daring raid by a German U-boat. There was some loss of life, and the Navy improved their anti-submarine defences thereafter. Of the Queen Elizabeth class, the Barham was sunk by an Italian submarine, one of the few Italian successes against the Royal Navy, in the Mediterranean in November 1941. The Royal Navy also commissioned seven so-called treaty battleships. I must say something about the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, also known as the Five Power Treaty. And that brought in the so-called battleship holiday. Bear in mind these things were the equivalent, I suppose, in those days of nuclear weapons. They were very expensive to build and very expensive to run. And the five powers got together and decided they weren't going to build any more of them for 10 years. They did allow a few to be completed that were in build at the time. Quite a lot of, of other battleships that were in build were scrapped before they were completed. After the pause, battleships and battle cruisers were to be limited to 35,000 tons gross weight and carry guns no bigger than 16 inches. The battleships on the left there, the Nelson and the Rodney, us battleship people say they've been hit with the ugliness, but uh, they, they were quite effective. Aside from their ugliness, they carried nine 16-inch guns and a positive batteries of anti-aircraft guns. They were very effective anti-aircraft ships. They mounted their triple turrets forward of the superstructure. Now, the effect of that was to reduce the amount of armor. If you see my pointer here, the armor on a battleship is very heavy plate, which protects you from shell fire. And in the case of these Nelson class, they could run the armor only from there, where the magazines beneath this turret are located, back to just after the funnel there, which is where the engine room ends. So it was a weight-saving device to put them all forward of the superstructure. The Nelson and the Rodney as ships, they served all over the place. The Rodney was involved in the sinking of KMS Bismarck, about which more later. Both supported the D-Day landings and thereafter bombarded targets in northern France. Nelson was credited with destroying a group of five Tiger tanks that were parked off some 40 k's from the coast, thinking they were safe. They weren't. Both ships survived the war and were scrapped shortly thereafter. The King George V class were in a state of near completion at the start of the war. They were the Royal Navy's most modern battleships and were all in commission by mid-1942. HMS Prince of Wales was scarcely complete when sent to intercept Bismarck in May 1941. HMS King George V also participated in that action. Prince of Wales was sunk shortly thereafter, along with the battlecruiser Repulse in December 1941 by Japanese land-based bombers and torpedo bombers in the Gulf of Siam. 
Thereafter, the class was mainly involved in escorting convoys, Russian convoys, which were at the time threatened by German capital ships based in northern Norwegian fjords, in particular the Scharnhorst and the Tirpitz. The Royal Navy therefore entered World War II with 12 battleships in service. They lost three sunk by the end of 1941, but with the KG-5 class coming into commission over the same period, they were up to 14 by 1943, which was pretty much equivalent to the US Navy at the same time. I think the US Navy had a few more, but not many. And certainly much more powerful than any other Navy in the conflict. The Kriegsmarine, on the other hand, entered the war with effectively only two battleships in commission. That is KMS Scharnhorst and Neisnau. You can see a picture of one of them on the left there. In my opinion, the most beautiful battleships ever built. They were armed with 9 11-inch guns and could make over 30 knots. And at 38,000 tons, they were as big or bigger than any of the Royal Navy Treaty battleships, if not quite as well armed. Now, the Kriegsmarine also had three heavy cruisers which are worthy of a mention. They carried six 11-inch guns, but at only 16,000 tons, the Royal Navy called them pocket battleships. The most famous of them, Admiral Graf Spey, had some success interdicting and sinking merchant vessels in the South Atlantic, not far from here. It's important to note that when she did that, all the crews were always transferred to the Graf Spey and were later transferred to the supply vessel Altmark. In fact, they were eventually rescued by the Navy from a Norwegian fjord. Graf Spey herself was scuttled after the Battle of the River Plate in December 1939. Scharnhorst and now participated in the invasion of Norway the course of which they sank the British aircraft carrier HMS Glorious. After a successful sortie into the Atlantic, that's called Operation Berlin, they put into Brest for mechanical repairs in March 1941. In 1942, after regular damage by RAF air attack, not a very good harbour to be in Brest, it's too close to the RAF, they had, and they attacked them pretty regularly. So the Scharnhorst, Neisner and Prince Eugen dashed up the channel under cover of Luftwaffe air support, suffering only minor damage from air attacks by the RAF and so that got them to the comparative safety of Kiel Harbour on the Baltic. It wasn't that safe because Neisner was further damaged by air attacks in 1942 and she was eventually scuttled, she never left Kiel. The Scharnhorst was sunk by the HMS Duke of York the Battle of the North Cape in December 1943, about which more later. So we come to the big ones. Nearing completion at the outbreak of war, Bismarck and Tirpitz, which in all respects or in some respects were contrary to the treaties and indeed were the contrary to a treaty that they had with the Royal Navy. They were the biggest and most powerful ships in the world at the time. They were armed with eight 15-inch guns and had a top speed of 30 knots. Although they were certainly the most powerful in Europe. We'll talk about the Japanese next week. At around 50,000 tons fully loaded, they were a lot larger than the Scharnhorst class and indeed the equivalent Royal Navy battleships. With a complement of over 2,000 officers and men, they carried a lot more crew than Royal Navy equivalent battleships. Tirpitz spent the war in a Norwegian fjord in the north of Norway and was subject of many attempts to sink her by air attack and once famously by midget submarines. She was eventually hit by RAF tall boy bombs in November 1944, capsizing and sinking at her mooring. She presented such a threat to Russian convoys, however, that reports of a large German capital ship exiting a fjord in Norway caused the order to scatter a convoy called PQ-17 in June 1942 with catastrophic losses to that convoy because they were picked off by U-boats and air attack and only something like a dozen ships out of 35 arrived in Murmansk eventually. To say that Churchill was obsessed with Tirpitz and constantly ordered attacks on her, she did eventually succumb. Other than her anti-aircraft guns, I don't think she fired a shot in anger. Bismarck, however, in May 1941, was deployed on 
exercise rowing. Let's have a look at exercise rowing. Operation Rainerbaum, KMS Bismarck, and KMS Prince Eugen, a heavy cruiser. Something about her, she displaced about 20,000 tons, so it wasn't small. She was 200 meters overall and had a speed of 32 knots. She had a crew of 1,400 officers and men and was armed with eight eight-inch guns. A little bit about that picture of her. That picture was taken in Bikini Atoll in 1946, and she's about to have an atom bomb dropped on her. The Royal Navy Intercept Force, HMS Hood, the last battle cruiser. She was, she displaced 47,000 tons, so she was actually bigger than the treaty battleships. The 262 meters overall length, she had a speed of 32 knots, and was armed with eight 15 inch guns. She was scheduled for a major rebuild in 1941, which would have turned her into a proper battleship with additional armor and probably new engines. HMS Prince of Wales was laid down at Camel Laird in Birkenhead in 1937. She was damaged in 1940 by Luftwaffe bombers and therefore her completion was delayed. She sailed to join Hood in May 1941 not fully operational at all, with shipyard workers still aboard. Not by no means all her guns were working properly and her gunnery control system was not properly calibrated. She displaced 44,000 tons and had a 227 meter overall length and could do 28 knots. Her armament was 10, 14 inch guns. She's a KG-5 class battleship. Let's have a look at who was involved here. Admiral Gunter Lutjens. Commander of Operation Rheinabung. He previously commanded Operation Berlin, so he had some experience in raiding merchant vessels in the Atlantic. Next up, Rear Admiral Lancelot Holland commanded the interception force of HMS Hood and Prince of Wales. Admiral Sir John Toby was CNC of the Home Fleet. He was aboard KG-5. Then there was a bit part player, Admiral James Somerville. He was Officer Commanding Force H and he was heading north out of Gibraltar. The German units came out of the Baltic, they're the red line. They came out of the Baltic and stopped in Bergen. They left Bergen at dawn on the 22nd of May. They had, however, been spotted, initially by Norwegian agents with little radios, and then by a reconnaissance Spitfire that was sent to take high-level photographs to confirm the intel. The Royal Navy therefore alerted their patrolling cruisers and dispatched capital ships to intercept. On the evening of the 23rd of May, 36 hours later, the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk, who were patrolling in the Denmark Strait, you see the Denmark Strait there between Iceland and Greenland, they were patrolling in the Denmark Strait and they located the German ships and started to shadow them using their radar. The Hood and the Prince of Wales are headed in that direction. And they made contact on the morning of the 24th of May. Action stations at 0525. Let's have a look. The Battle of the Denmark Strait. This comes from Sinclair Bismarck, 20th Century Fox film in 1960. Some of you may remember it. Hood and Prince of Wales are somewhere in here. Suffolk and Norfolk, the Port Bismarck and Prince Eugen here. If so, we shouldn't have long to wait. Should be getting light up there now. Signal from Suffolk, sir. Have sighted Hood and Prince of Wales, bearing southeast, distance 15 miles. That means they've made it. Good old Hood, she'll get them.
Rich. Smoke bearing green 4-0, sir. Bismarck and cruiser bearing green 4-0, about 12 miles. Closing fast. Those are not cruisers, they are battleships. Captain, open fire on the leading ship. Target leading ship, stand by to open fire. Target leading ship, stand by to open fire. Hard to port. Open fire when you have the range. Concentrate on Bismarck. Aye, sir. Let me know when you're ready to engage guns and then we'll turn. Aye, sir. Tell Prince of Wales to open fire when she's in range. Aye, sir. How to stop it? Shoot! Range 25,000, bearing 300. All carriage ready to open fire, sir. Open fire! Fire! Close for comfort. Turn 20 degrees to starboard, Captain. Shoot! Fire! Yeoman. Yes, sir. Make the Admiralty from Prince of Wales. Tell them. Tell them the hood has blown up. Aye, aye, sir. Starboard 15. Starboard 15, sir. Starboard 15. Signal from Prince of Wales, sir. Well, what is it? It says HMS Hood has blown up. Bring it here. Signal from Suffolk, sir. Johnson. Hood sunk. Prince of Wales and Bismarck exchanging fire. Fire! <laughs> After the sinking of HMS Hood, Prince of Wales withdraws from a somewhat one-sided battle. She was damaged by hits from both the German ships, and only half her guns were working by then, and her fire control systems, as I said before, hadn't been properly calibrated, and she retires under a smoke screen, but continues to shadow with Norfolk and Suffolk. She did, however, hit Bismarck a couple of times. One hit damaged the fuel tanks and caused a leak. Not too serious as and of itself, but as Bismarck had not fully topped up her fuel in Bergen before she left, Admiral Lutyens decides to head for Brest to have the damage repaired rather than go on into a rendezvous with a tanker in the vastness of the Atlantic. She takes a turn to starboard, sending Prince Eugen on her way to attack convoys in the Atlantic. You can see the, the red lines they diverge at this point. The Prince Eugen heads on south-southwest. The Bismarck turns southeast.
she had to reduce her speed because she's going to run out of fuel otherwise. And she's also training an oil slick, which has an implication. On the evening of the 24th of May, aircraft carrier Victorious, which was part of the rest of the home fleet pursuing her, sends nine swordfish bombers guided in by Norfolk. The weather was very poor indeed. They did manage a single torpedo hit, did no significant damage, and miraculously, they all made it back to the carrier. The shadowing force of Norfolk, Suffolk and Prince of Wales unfortunately lose contact with Bismarck early in the morning of the 25th of May. At this point, Lutchens makes a mistake. Believing that she's still being shadowed, he sends a long signal to German HQ, which allows the British to triangulate his position. But Toby had thought he was heading back to the North Sea. There was clearly some mention of repairs and headed in the wrong direction. You can see them, they disappeared off towards the northeast. Bismarck, however, is continuing southeast towards Brest. So they lose her comprehensively for a whole day. Fortunately, however, on the morning of the 26th of May, a Catalina flying boat out of Northern Ireland spots Bismarck a mere 700 miles from Brest and much closer than that to Luftwaffe air cover. The nearest aircraft carrier at this point was part of Force H coming up from the south, which was the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. She was part of Somerville's Force H and she launches nine swordfish. However, not knowing how close the cruiser Sheffield was to Bismarck, mistook her and attacked. Here are the swordfish. Mr. Bismarck, all right? Mr. Bismarck, all right? It's all right, they're ours. Swordfish. Sounds like they're going to fly right over us, sir. It's all right. Using our position to get their bearings. Sounds like they're going to fly I right over us, sir. They they're using our position to get their bearings. I can see them, sir. There they are. Pull ahead, both. Hard the port. Pull ahead, both. All guns, hold on fire. Pull ahead, both. Hard the port. Pull ahead, both. All guns, hold on fire. Torpedo explosion. Hit the water, sir. That's another one. Hit the water. That's another one. They're exploding, Sean. What's the matter with them? It's those damn magnetic exploders. They're exploding, Sean. What's the matter with them? It's those damn magnetic exploders. Here comes on the tip deck motion. Hard as starboard. Hard as starboard. Here comes on the tip deck motion. Hard as starboard. Hard as starboard. That was the Sheffield, sir. Just came through from the carrier. Signal the other that aircraft. Was the Tell them to break off the attack. Just came through from the carrier. Signal the other aircraft. Wheel Tell them to break off Wheel the attack. Wheel of midships. Wheel of midships. Wheel of midships. Stop. We all feel the same about what's happened, so there's no point in discussing it. I just say that we've learned a very important lesson, which may well prove a blessing in disguise. I just say that we've learned a very important lesson. Let's get on with the job. Prove a blessing still enough light for one more attack. All right. Think you're up to it? Let's get on with the job. What about those? Still enough light for one more attack. They're being changed at this moment. Go back to contact exploders on the torpedoes. They're being changed at this moment. Go back to contact exploders on the torpedoes. Keep your seats. I have a message here from the commander in chief. Unless the enemy's speed has been reduced by midnight, King George V will have to abandon the chase and turn back for refueling. midnight, King George V will have to abandon the chase and turn back for refueling. This is our last chance, gentlemen. No need to tell you what that means. I suggest you go below and get something to eat. This is our last chance, gentlemen. You'll we'll be taking off at 18:30. I suggest you go below and get something to eat. You'll we'll be taking off at 18:30. <laughs> Don't you love these airplanes? 
That is to a natural Peter without a bit of poetic license. Steering compartment, sir. Put your Captain, rudder amidships. Rudder amidships. Put your rudder amidships. Rudder amidships. The rudder won't move, sir. The rudder won't move, sir. They make several attempts to repair this rudder. They send divers down and nothing works. Luchin's event signals Germany. Ship unmaneuverable. We shall fight the last shell. Long live the Fuhrer. Battleships Rodney and King George V await for daylight on the 27th of May before opening fire at 8.47. How much fuel have we got left? We shall have to break off action in two hours. Main armament ready. Enemy speed 10 knots, course 350, sir. They are numbers two to one, and we can't do more than 10 knots. What are you saying, Captain? This is the Bismarck. We still have all our guns, and any moment now the Luftwaffe will arrive. Open fire! Fire! Open fire! Shoot! Fire! Shoot! Shoot it! Good shooting, Captain. Shoot!
Signal from King George V, sir. Bismarck on fire amidships, turf or turrets out of action. Right. I thought I'd be cheering, sir, at this point, but I'm afraid I can't. I know, it's always that way. Shoot! <laughs> Hoffman, we have to fly the forward magazines. Get the men out. They can't get out, sir. They're tapped by the fires. There's too much danger of blowing up. Flood them. What about the men? I gave an order, Hoffman. Fly the forward magazines. Flood the forward magazines. Fuel state is critical, sir. Get closer, get closer. We've got to finish her now. Shoot! All guns out of action, except a turret, sir. Where is your Luftwaffe now, sir? I don't understand it. The Führer promised. Promised to see. He was proud of that. Tomorrow the world. He said that only yesterday. He was right. I... Sir, all the officers on the bridge are dead. I have to tell you that all the guns are finished. Finished. Tell the men to abandon ship! Abandon ship! Abandon ship! We've got her. She's finished. The Dorset Show has joined us, sir. Huh? Tell Dorset John, finish her off with torpedoes. Aye, aye, sir. Cease firing. Cease firing. Did put in a good number of torpedoes into her, and she rolled over and sank an hour or so later. The sinking of the Bismarck and constant air attacks by the RAF on Scharnhorst, Nysau, and Prince Eugen in Brest means that the Battle of the Atlantic is now essentially Royal Navy versus u boats the supply of war material, however, to USSR by convoys to Murmansk in the Russian Arctic starts after Operation Barbarossa in mid-1941. 24 hours of daylight in the summer months and constant threat of air attack means that Russian convoys are generally run during the winter in conditions of extreme cold and constant darkness. KMS Tirpitz and Scharnhorst were essentially a fleet in being, which necessitated the use of battleships to escort the winter convoys. On the day after Christmas in 1943, Scharnhorst makes her move. The Battle of the North Cape was fought in total darkness, eliminated only by star shells, and if you didn't have radar, you had nothing to shoot at. The Kriegsmarine comprised KMS Scharnhorst, there on the right, five destroyers, and her commander was Admiral Eric Bay. The Royal Navy 
At HMS Duke of York, one heavy cruiser, four light cruisers, nine destroyers. And she was commanded by Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser. There were two convoys, one going to Mamansk and one coming back from Mamansk. Essentially, the Scharnhorst was after the one on its way to Mamansk, obviously, because that's the one that had much more value to them. And she came across Force One, which was escorting that convoy, Mamansk bound convoy, which comprised a heavy cruiser, Norfolk, light cruisers, Sheffield, and Belfast. Force Two under Admiral Fraser comprised the battleship Duke of York and the light cruiser Jamaica, also and some destroyers. The initial contact, Sean Horse and Force One, a lucky shot damaged Sean Horse radar. And in the almost perpetual darkness of the northern winter, it meant that really all she had to aim at was the gun flashes of the British cruisers. She therefore turned around and headed south away from the Force 2 convoy and into the arms of Force 1, where she was engaged by the Duke of York at 1648 using radar gunnery control and star shells from HMS Belfast. In the paintings that follow, you will see the star shells. We really are talking about the end of a brave and beautiful ship here. The first salvo scored a hit, knocking out the forward turrets of the Scharnhorst. The Kriegsmarine called them Anton and Brunner. So Anton and Brunner turrets were knocked out in the first salvo. There was a shot from Scharnhorst passed through the Duke of York's masts, knocking out one of their radar aerials. Lieutenant HRK Bates of the Royal Navy Voluntary Reserve, the electrical officer aboard the Duke of York, in utterly appalling conditions, I can't imagine. A force eight gale, complete darkness and much ice. Climbed the mast, and managed to return the aerial to the horizontal and make it work. There was a myth told of Bates repairing the wires with his bare hands, causing him to be given the nickname Bare Hand Bates. A shell from the Duke of York into Sharnhorst number one boiler reduced her speed to 10 knots. They did actually manage to get her going again up to about 22 knots. Bay at this point signals the German naval commands we will fight until the last shell is fired. John Horst turns to engage destroyers Savage and Samarez, allowing the destroyers Scorpion and the Norwegian destroyer Stord to in turn attack her with torpedoes from the other side. I will let Drachenifel carry on the story. Unfortunately, in turning to engage Savage and Samaritz, the ship has exposed itself to attack by Scorpion and Stored. Scharnhorst takes evasive action, turning parallel to the torpedo's tracks, but still takes one hit out of the eight torpedoes fired. Her bad luck doesn't end there, however, since turning to this position has put her right in the sights of Savage and Samaritz, coming out from under her secondary battery fire, who launched their own volley. This is far more damaging, landing three hits on the port side of Scharnhorst, in exchange for the Samurats finally being hit by several guns from the Scharnhorst secondary battery. All the destroyers also engage in a furious cannonade with the Scharnhorst, trying to suppress the same secondary weapons. One of these torpedoes impacts adjacent to a boiler room, flooding it and damaging one of the propeller shafts, which immediately drops the Scharnhorst top speed back down to 10 knots. Once again, German damage repair crews go into frantic repair mode, and once again the ship's speed rises back up to between 20 and 22 knots. However, it would appear the damage inflicted was too much for the crews, as from this point onwards, Shan Horse speed gradually begins to drop down again throughout the rest of the engagement. During the destroyer attack, Duke of York and Jamaica have turned bow in and closed the range as quickly as possible. Now, as it dies away, the two ships reopen fire at a range of just over 10,000 yards. To the north, Norfolk and Belfast show up, with Sheffield trailing well behind them. 
Norfolk's radar is still out, so after two salvos, she checks her fire due to difficulty in assessing the range properly. Meanwhile, Belfast happily hammers away with its six-inch battery. With all three firing ships still having radar guidance, and with the range having closed to near point blank, the Scharnhorst is turned into a charnel house of fire and explosions within five minutes. Despite this, what's left of her main armament and her rapidly diminishing secondary battery continue to engage Duke of York and Jamaica as best they can. Jamaica and Belfast, plus the four destroyers from convoy RA-55A, close in and fire a couple of dozen more torpedoes in her general direction. At this point, sporadic ammunition explosions and spreading fires aboard the ship are basically destroying any remaining combat capacity she has left. The cruisers claim at least three hits between them, and the destroyers up to seven, although the post-battle assessment considers that a total of five hits is probably the most accurate. The reports around this time are somewhat confused by the fact that Scharnhorst had taken on a heavy list to starboard, and most of the crew were in the middle of preparations to abandon ship, although one of the survivors did confirm to the British that three hits in quick succession were scored on the starboard side, indicating hits from the same salvo of torpedoes from a single ship. Having fired the torpedoes on one side, Belfast has hauled around to fire the torpedoes on the other side, only to find that all she can see of Scharnhorst is a conglomeration of smoke, mist, snow and steam, lit red and orange by a glow of a burning ship somewhere inside. Belfast therefore holds fire. By the accounts of her crew, at this time Scharnhorst goes under, with her propellers still turning. Moments thereafter, there is some sort of significant explosion as the ship heads for the bottom that's both felt and heard aboard all the British ships, although the actual sinking itself is unseen by those British ships due to the smoke and glow of the fires. Unfortunately, in her death throes, Scharnhorst takes most of the 1,968 men aboard down with her. A few hundred have made it off the ship, but they're in freezing Arctic water and with poor visibility by the time the British ships close it in with nets and ropes to rescue survivors, only 36 have survived. None of the survivors are officers, with the most senior prisoner being the equivalent of an acting petty officer. Admiral Fraser later debriefed his officers aboard Duke of York. Gentlemen, the battle against Sean Horse has ended in victory for us. I hope that if you are ever called upon to lead a ship into battle against an opponent many times your superior, you will command your ship as gallantly as Sean Horse was commanded today. The loss of Sean Horse demonstrated vital importance of radar and naval warfare. She would have given a much better account of herself had she not lost her radar early in the proceedings. With Scharnhorst destroyed and other German battleships out of service one reason or another, the Allies were for the first time in the war free from the threat of German battleships raiding their convoys in the Arctic and the Atlantic. Thank you.